Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another ARA Webinar Wednesday. I'm Jerry DiMaggio, your moderator for today's program entitled Calibration, uh, Making Predictions Match Pavement Performance. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker and my colleague, uh, Mr. John Donahue. John is currently a principal engineer at ARA after recently retiring from Missouri DOT. He spent 24 years with Missouri Don and worked primarily in the construction and materials area with some of his responsibilities being consisting of specification and standard plan development, value engineering activities, contract administration, dispute resolution, and statewide pavement evaluation training. During this time, John also led the in-house pavement design policy activities. This included spearheading the implementation of mechanistic empirical pavement design guide program for both rigid and flexible pavement design throughout the state of Missouri. This made MoDOT one of the first agencies to do so. He also was overseeing the local calibration of the program to align it with model predictions more closely and the actual field performance of the state. Now I turn the program over to John. Okay, thank you, Jerry. <clears throat> For quickly, I'm going to go through the topics we'll be discussing this webinar. And, and by the way, I do appreciate everyone that's attending. Um, this is somewhat of a dry subject. I'll try to make it as interesting as possible. Um, I'm not going to uh, drill down too deeply in a lot of these topics, uh, skim over uh, the ones I can, and, and, and uh, <clears throat> go into a little more detail about the ones that, that do merit more discussion. Anyway, we're going to first talk about what mechanistic empirical payment design is, um, because that's the that's what we're using and that's what we want to uh, address with calibration. Uh, the purpose of calibration, transfer functions, which are part of the payment design process, setting up the payment type design matrix in order to proceed with the calibration process, the performance and materials data collection, which is necessary to uh, uh, to do the uh, distress predictions, the verification process, which always precedes calibration, and the final validation of the calibration. Okay, uh, where we are with current pavement design. Right now, most agencies are probably using some form of a mechanistic empirical design method. Um, it's Probably, it, it goes back quite a ways. Uh, everything started more with an empirical design, which is primarily running a truck over a certain pavement and seeing how many times you can do that before it cracks or ruts or whatever you're trying to measure. Um, mechanistic empirical design provides a little more intelligent basis for um, coming up with predictions. So you have a mechanistic component, and this is using some fundamental material law where you're stimulating the pavement in a way to produce a stress, strain, or deflection. And the idea is, is that every time you do that, you have a little incremental loss of service life or damage. The empirical component is linking that mechanistic measurement to some manifestation of the stress in the field. So you can't, can't get away from this idea that uh, you can't just model something completely without verifying it in the field, uh, you know, how the uh, the model's actually behaving. So to provide some background, um, we're going to, when we go through this discussion and we talk about the distress models, we're really talking about the distress models from the ASHTOWER, specifically the ASHTOWER Payment ME Design Program. At this point in time, about 80% of the state agencies are license holders of this. They're not all using it for regular design. Some of them are still in uh, kind of an evaluation process. Where they're doing local calibration, but the point is, is everyone's is slowly, um, you know, at different rates of speed, progressing towards using this this program. And uh, in addition to the states, there's a number of Canadian provinces, and there's a lot of international license holders of the, the program as well. Now, some fun facts about payment and design. Uh, there's really two mechanistic, what I would call mechanistic engines in the program. One is to predict distresses or predict payment responses in 
flexible or asphalt pavements that use employees in elastic clear program. On the concrete side or the rigid pavement side, it uses a finite element model, not directly though, because running an FE model computationally would take way too long. So the responses are accurately predicted using artificial neural networks to uh, um, approximate what the FE uh, responses would be. Um, there are prediction models or transfer functions in there. That's, uh, you know, again, that's linking mechanistic response with what's seen in the field, and we'll dive into that a little more. Um, but the point here is, is that there are multiple design payment types in the payment ME design. It's probably what kind of gives an advantage over, there's other payment ME design processes, but usually they target a specific payment type. Here you can pretty much do everything, flexible, rigid pavement, uh, semi-rigid pavement, and multiple distress models for each one of those payment types. And lastly, the model, the, the, the payment ME design models were calibrated, or we call globally calibrated with long-term payment performance program data. This was the largest payment research program ever. Uh, it, it was initiated in the 1980s, and at this point in time, there's still certain payment sections where data is being acquired and, you know, using to further calibrate and, and validate uh, the, uh, the models. <clears throat> now, before we talk about payments, I thought it'd be nice to just keep things simple and try to employ these concepts that we're going to go over with just a simple paperclip. So what we're trying to do here is we want to find out how many times we can bend the end of the paper clip at a 90 degree angle, bend it back and keep going through those cycles. How many times can we do it before it actually snaps off? So experimentally, we're going to try this at different angles. You can see the data point. So at, at uh, bending it at 90 degrees, we can, we can go a total of 23 times, uh, 65 degrees, a total of 52 and, and so on. And if plot this data uh, on a, you can see on a log log scale there, we can come up with a formula relating the bending angle to the number of possible cycles that we can, <clears throat> we can do that. At. Taking this a step further, um, we can figure out what the damage per cycle is. So from that table, if we were to bend it one time at 45 degrees, uh, the math is dividing one by 132, which is the number of total cycles you can do at 45 degrees, and your damage accumulation is 0 0.0076. So then you can also accumulate damage doing uh, bending it at uh, different angles for a different number of times. So for each angle you bend it at, for 25 cycles at 45 degrees, your damage accumulation is going to be 0.189. So the idea is here, when you reach one, theoretically, a total of one is a damage. That's the point that's going to fail. This basically employs Miner's hypothesis, which is the most common damage accumulation model around. It's used for a lot of things, not just paper clips and pavements, but other materials as well. Um, it's not totally absolutely correct, but it's it's good enough. It holds up well enough to use. The assumption is is that the first cycle you bend this paper clip at, you'll have the exact same amount of damage as the last cycle when it you know just before it fails. And again, that idea isn't totally true, but it's it's good enough for this purpose. And like I said, it holds up uh, uh, when in use with the uh, the stress models. So trying to schematically look at what's happening uh, with the pavement uh, design program, uh, <clears throat> first we have the inputs, all right? There's three major categories, climate, precipitation, temperature has an impact on uh, expansion and contraction of the, uh, the stabilized layers, uh, it affects the stiffness of all the layers. Uh, of course, traffic, uh, the actual physical loading on the pavement structure and then the material properties themselves have an influence on how the uh, the pavement layers respond. And, you know, you're applying this to the, the mechanistic model in the program, and it's producing these stresses, strains, or deflections. Take that one step further, you're putting it through whatever the fundamental material law is for those stresses, strains, deflections, 
and then you have some damage accumulation, and finally the transfer function, which relates these responses to the increase in distress uh, as a progression of either time or traffic. So going back to this paperclip uh, idea here, okay, it works well for steel, a steel paperclip of a given thickness gauge, a given yield stress, um, you know, certain shape. How does it hold up if we would apply it to a plastic paper clip of the same shape or another steel clip that was shaped differently or a plastic paper clip that's shaped differently? Um, the formula, my guess would be it's not going to work quite as well. So what's going to happen is, is you're going to have to adjust something in the formula. This is assuming we can still use the formula, kind of the overriding assumption in my whole discussion is the fact that the material laws themselves, we're not introducing a material that's so foreign or different that we basically have to rewrite the material laws. So we can kind of keep it in its basic form, but what we need to do is we need to adjust the coefficients in order to make it match, uh, you know, accurately the number of cycles to, to fatigue or failure for these different types of clips. Okay. Which brings us to calibration. Okay, the purpose of calibration is we're systematically eliminating any bias or inaccuracy and minimizing the residual errors or basically trying to improve the precision between observed or measured results from the real world and predicted results from the model. Key here, this is what the whole point of this discussion is, is we're just trying to make the predicted distresses match the measured distresses in the field. And graphically, in real simple form here, to show what we're talking about, here's an here's a, a uh, now keep in mind, uh, when you're graphing predicted versus measured distress, if everything's working perfectly and predicted stress equals measured distress, all your data points should be along that line of equality, which is the, the 45 degree line. In this case here, uh, we have a bias or an inaccuracy, but it's a consistent bias, okay? so. Um, you can see that what the offset is, uh, it's basically under predicting the, uh, uh, the measured distress, but the data points, pretty much the residual errors, in other words, the difference between measured and predicted is minimal. So you have what would be considered a higher bias, but a lower standard error. The flip, of, flip side of that is this case here where the, the mean of the, all this scattered data seems to approximate the, the line of equality here. But you, you do have a lot of deviations. So you have a higher standard error in this case, uh, or lower precision. And this is what we're shooting for. You know, we, we want to group all those points tightly around that line of equality between predicted and measured distresses. So uh, the payment and redesign program was globally calibrated, which meant it was using all the nationally available data from the long-term payment performance database. There are a few other sources of data as well, but this was the primary one uh, for each respective design type. So what that means is, is that it, it, it appropriately characterized the payment predictions that would happen across the board. The problem is, is if you're an agency, you're kind of representing a, a section of that data. And if you're just putting a spotlight on looking at predicted versus measured for your own agency region or whatever, um, you may wind up with a larger bias or standard error for different reasons. Uh, states use different mixed materials, uh, prefer different design options, have different climate patterns. Maybe the most important one is uh, the change in climate. Uh, take for instance, if you have a, uh, you know, take identical pavements, everything, uh, are the same in terms of thickness, uh, com material components, have the exact same truck traffic distribution on it, and yet you have one in Colorado, another in Florida, the odds are the, you know, the, the actual uh, observed results are not going to be the same between those two. So if you determine that, if, you, if you're going through this verification uh, with the payment and design with with your own performance data and things aren't lining up well, uh, bias or standard error is unacceptable, 
then at that point you're going to make the decision we probably need to locally calibrate. So what are we actually playing with? We're playing with the transfer function here or the, the combination of the transfer function and, and the damage accumulation. This is what we're numerically trying to adjust in order to make predicted measurements or predicted predicted distresses match measured distresses. So diving into transfer functions a little bit. Um, <clears throat> each distress model has its own uh, payment response to distress relationships. So in other words, they're you know basically different formulas for each type of distress. And as you saw with the uh, kind of that the material law there for paper clips, you have coefficients that can be adjusted for local conditions without having to basically rearrange the the uh, the design model itself. Um, and uh, it most and I'll explain this a little bit better, but most transfer functions have kind of an intermediate step or a damage accumulation component uh, that relies on some of the material properties. Um, but there is also, uh, which is kind of an indirect relationship. There is one direct relationship. But before I get into detail on that, let's just discuss what distress models are we actually able to calibrate. And this is the list of available models, distress models within the pavement and design program. You can predict rut depth both just in the asphalt layer itself and the total rut depth asphalt plus the uh, uh, the, the lower base, sub-base, subgrade layers. Fatigue cracking, bottom up and top down, uh, different distress models, so they are calculated separately from each other. They're not not combined together in the pavement ME design program. Transverse cracking, which is essentially thermal cracking, environmentally related. Uh, reflective cracking, this is uh, placing an overlay on a new pavement and then uh, modeling, uh, you know, when it's going to crack transversely from a combination of both reflection and thermal cracking and uh, the measurement of smoothness, which is the International Roughness Index, or IRI. For semi-rigid layers, and semi-rigid layer is an asphalt layer on a stabilized or treated base, sub-base, subgrade, usually with something like cement or uh, fly ash or something that, that's greatly increasing the, the modulus or stiffness of the layer. So similar design models to the flexible designs, so you can measure rut depth, uh, you're measuring bottom up and top down fatigue cracking, uh, transverse cracking, you know, again, thermal thermal cracking, and then uh, reflection cracking for both new and rehab, because by design, you've got asphalt on a stiff layer. And that layer, the stiff layer is going to crack and reflect through the original asphalt lift on top of it. And then if you go ahead and overlay that later with another lift, then you're trying to model what the uh, the reflection cracking is through the uh, uh, through the most recent overlay as well. And of course, we're measuring IRI too. On the concrete side, for jointed plain concrete pavement, the main two default me or uh, distress mechanisms, faulting, mid-slab cracking, which is uh, really transverse T cracking. It's a uh, combined measure of top-down and bottom-up cracking, and then for rehab, if you're placing an overlay, asphalt overlay, it's a measure of the reflective cracking through that and IRI. Continuously reinforced concrete pavement, really the only fatigue distress here is punch outs. So we're predicting those as well as reflective cracking if it's if it's overlaid uh, later on and IRI. So to show you kind of how the, what I would call the indirect transfer function relationship works, uh, let's look at fatigue cracking in a concrete slab. So we've got a, a uh, uh, track axle load. Um, you can see it there. It's in the middle of the slab. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have it's, that, that load is going to induce tensile stresses either at the top or at the bottom of the slab, depending on the, uh, the curvature of the slab and the, uh, uh, the placement of the axle, either whether it's in the middle or at the, at the edge of, of the, uh, the joint edge of the slab. And uh, the, the material law, the fundamental material law, is going to be a function that the number of cycles you can load it at this particular type of loading is going to be derivative of the tensile stress that you're applying to the, uh, the concrete slab. There's, 
I, I'm showing simplified versions of these formulas. There's other material inputs that are necessary, such as the, uh, the modulus of rupture uh, for the concrete as well. But the idea here is, is that that's the, the principal, uh, um, the mechanistic response, that's that stress, that tensile stress. And then you're taking this and you're putting it through that, the miner's hypothesis damage accumulation uh, <clears throat> formula. And then you're taking that and finally plugging it through the transfer function. So the, the amount of physical cracking you see is a function of the damage accumulation. You're not jumping straight to a from a tensile stress to a prediction of fatigue cracking. So you have these intermediate steps. Most of the stress models are set up this way. Now, kind of the one exception to the rule, and this isn't necessary for you to really, I mean, this isn't critical to remember anything, but I'm just, I'm just presenting it anyway here, uh, would be rutting in uh, the asphalt and, and unbound layers. So it's, uh, the the mechanistic response here is is vertical strain. Um, more specifically, we're interested in the the plastic component of of the vertical strain. Uh, but in, again, this is simplified. There's you know a few other things happening here, but we're really kind of bypassing the intermediate uh, uh, material law damage accumulation thing. We're going straight to a uh, cumulative rut depth measurement or deformation. Uh, measurement based uh, on these uh, plastic strain components, adding them together for each of the layers. Okay, so before we calibrate, you know, before we worry about calibration, the first thing we have to do is verify. So in order to verify, the first step is setting up a pavement design matrix. So, um, you know, we have to compare the, me the measure distresses with uh, with what's being predicted, um, you know, and then if it's statistically reasonable, we stop there. But verification to initially do this requires setting up a design matrix with representative samples of agency design types. So, you, so I mean, there's some some design models in the payment and design. If you don't construct those, you know, you're not going to worry about uh, verifying and calibrate calibrating them. Obviously, uh, you need measured data. So this is you know, it requires legwork to go out either sampling it in the field or using a lot of asset management uh, information from uh, uh, data collection done over the years. Um, and then uh, running the pavement ME design using the global calibration coefficients. Those are the default. Those are the existing coefficients. If you haven't done a local calibration yet, then your models have the global calibration coefficients. So that's your starting point. And you're acquiring the relevant materials, traffic, and climate inputs that you need to run these designs. And then, uh, and then finally, you uh, perform the uh, statistical analysis on the predicted versus measure comparisons. Okay, so for the design matrix, uh, three things to talk about here. You want factorial balance. In other words, balance in each of the cells in the matrix. You need a minimum number of sections to do the conventional split sampling uh, analysis. Uh, and you need a certain maturity level in the, uh, the performance histories of the pavement sections that you're using. So the, the matrix is kind of split um, by two types of factors. One, the primary tier, tier factors basically are those defining the pavement structure. And there's a reason for setting it up this way, which I'll show you visually. Um, but the primary tier factors would include thickness, surface mix type, base type, subgrade classification. I mean, you can add some other, you know, maybe sub base, whatever. There's some other things you can add as well. The, uh, the two big secondary tier factors, um, these are ones that basically influence the distress is uh, predicted would be a truck traffic and climate region. Again, you could probably come up with some other ones that, uh, you know, or maybe, uh, you know, split truck traffic or climate somehow to come up with some subcategories. Now to show you by example, what we're doing here, this is uh, a sample design matrix that we're creating for new asphalt pavements. So we're in a state that has a number of neat binder mixes, and by neat binder, I mean there's no modification of the asphalt in the mixes. 
Um, and then on their higher volume routes, they, uh, they, they prefer to use uh, stone matrix SMA mixes for the wearing surface. And then they also have a number of polymer modified asphalt sections as well. And you can take those and then further subdivide it by the type of prevalent base bases that are used, which would be either unbound granular or cement treated bases. And then we take that one step further and we're going to split that by thickness. We're looking at pavements that are less than or equal to six inches or greater than six inches. And then on our secondary, on our secondary tier, uh, you know, the stuff you see there on the, uh, the lower uh, left-hand side, uh, we have two environmentally different regions, which we're calling the north and the south. And we're taking that one step further yet and dividing it by truck traffic. We're going to look at uh, 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 pavements that have uh, less than 2,000 trucks per day and then those that have uh, you know, equal to or greater than 2,000 trucks a day. You put all this together and you wind up with a matrix that has 48 cells to, to, uh, to fill. Now, when reality sinks in and you're trying to find uh, actual pavement sections for all of these, you, you come to realize you don't have quite as many as you thought. Turns out that you don't have hardly any uh, pavements uh, using uh, the neat or, or polymer modified um, asphalts where uh, you use the cement treated base under a pavement that's six inches or less. So the nice thing here is, is that's kind of not, it's easy, it's, it's easy to physically block those out and then not include them in the analysis and then try to fill the remaining cells. So that's kind of the reason for this primary versus secondary tier setup is uh, you can, I mean, two purposes. One here at the beginning, <clears throat> when you're setting up the matrix and you're trying to acquire the data, uh, it helps you there. And then there's a second point in time when you're going through the verification if you're trying to come up with, uh, which I'll discuss more, but if you're trying to reduce the bias or standard error, you may find that there's a certain pavement type that's causing it in your design matrix. So again, you can go back, block those out, not include those, rerun the, uh, the split sample uh, testing analysis, and then see if that helps reduce your standard error and bias. Okay, now the uh, there is a minimum number of sections you need to do uh, normal split sample testing at different confidence levels. Uh, the first thing you need to know is what the Z value is from a normal distribution. So what this essentially is, is how many standard deviations do I need to go on either side of the mean? Again, assuming that I have a normal distribution with the data. <clears throat> And uh, that kind of defines the comp. So at 90%, you know, whatever, however many standard deviations that is, that's going to, you know, I go out on either side of the mean. <clears throat> and so all my possible outcomes are going to fit within that area, or 90% of the possible outcomes are going to fit within that, that area. Then there's also the standard deviation of the maximum observed distress for all sections in the calibration data set, which is over the, uh, the time history of, say, for a a, a single pavement section is whatever the maximum distress is of all those data points. Now, logically, you'd think it would normally be the last observation, uh, you know, because you expect distress to uniformly increase. Doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes, you know, for whatever reason, uh, some measurement error or something, it, it might have happened one or two years before your last uh, observation, but that's what you're using here, and that's what you're figuring out the standard deviation for. And then finally, the, the uh, tolerable uh, bias, which is um, related to the residual error, the difference between measured and predicted distress performance. Fortunately, you don't have to figure this out. It's already been done for you, and this was done during the global calibration of the pavement enemy design program. Uh, these were the, the numbers generated for the bias and the standard deviation and maximum measured distresses for each one of the uh, um, distress models they're showing for uh, flexible and rigid. So we basically have what we need to run that calculation. Um, we've got the bias, the standard deviation, and we're going to go with a 90% confidence level, which is probably the, the conventional one to use in most cases. and you can, and then you have there in that column, you have the number of minimum number of sections you need 
for each one of those distress models. Roughly speaking, most of them require about 30 or more. There's uh, you know exception for rutting and uh, punch outs where you can get five less. But you can see here where you know you, you have to kind of balance the confidence level with practicality. Uh, you know, 95% confidence level. It sounds great, but then I'm going to need like uh, you know 10 or 12 more sections for some of these models, and I'm, I'm having trouble coming up with just the, the ones I need at 90%. So you have to have to live with what you've got available. <clears throat> and this is kind of my opinion, but I think most people that have gone through the local calibration process would agree with me on this, is finding an adequate number of field sections to complete the design matrix is the single most difficult task for calibration. That's not to say there's not other things that require a lot of work and effort, but, um, you know, like materials testing. You know, yeah, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a big uh, mountain to climb, but you can do it. You can acquire materials data. You can either test it in your own lab or have somebody else test it or whatever, go through the process. You cannot make pavement sections appear out of thin air though. Either you have them or you don't. And, you know, flushing this out a little more about what are some of the issues with that is the fact that uh, a lot of the LTP sections are comprised of older mixed designs and pavement configurations uh, from an earlier era that may have fallen out of favor by now. And probably the best example I can think of are jointed reinforced concrete pavements. Uh, you know, when the LTPP program was being set up in the late 80s, at that point in time, there are still a number of states using those as a conventional concrete design. But then in the 90s, uh, I think most of the states transitioned to jointed plain concrete. It's to the point now where nobody does them really. And, uh, there is in fact no uh, design model in the pavement ME design for jointed reinforced concrete pavements, which means that that data is, is useless. You can't use that for anything. And also kind of related to this issue is the fact that because states were going to newer design methods, newer mixed materials, um, when some of them started the local calibration process, maybe as early as 15 years ago, uh, historically, they just didn't have pavement sections that were very old incorporating these features, uh, super paid mix design that really, uh, I think, uh, you know, it, it really uh, became an integral part of, of asphalt mix design probably around the, the late 90s is when most states really got into it. Uh, using recycled material, experimentally, I mean, you know, this stuff was done off and on before then, but uh, but it wasn't really adopted with widespread use uh, until the uh, the 2000s. And the polymer modified asphalt, same thing, things like that, ground tire rubber. And so you have a lot of these LTPP sections that have little representation of these newer features. So you're stuck using your own pavement sections that you built, not part of the LTPP program. And you're finding you only have like five to 10 years worth of data for those. So that's an issue. Um, you can calibrate it using that data, but you know you're going to verify basically the uh, you know the, the the initial part of the distress prediction timeline. You're not really validating anything out in the future of 20 or 30 years if you don't have data that goes that far. Uh, as far as the design matrix cell makeup, you should have two replicate test sections in each cell. Uh, a lot of times you're fortunate to find one, though, so it just doesn't happen that way. Now, if you have less than the minimum number of test sections, there are a couple uh, tricks of the trade for getting around that. Uh, two methods that, that have come into vogue, I guess, in the last 30, 40 years are jackknifing and bootstrapping. Without going into detail about those, it's, it's essentially taking the hand that you're dealt and coming up with different ways of uh, leaving a card out uh, going through the analysis, putting the card back in, taking another card out, going through analysis, uh, or doing multiple resampling of cards within that. But you're you're using the data you have and just recombining it in different ways. And by going through all these iterations, you eventually create so much data from analyzing these different combinations that you 
create this cloud of points that 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 over time the, or over the the efforts you do become a, a uh, normal distribution. Mm -hmm. So uh, performance history timelines. You for every pavement section, um, you're going to have multiple data points ideally. So let's say we have a pavement section that's 20 years old. If we're collecting data every 20 years, that'd be nice. We'd have 20 data points. A lot of times, though, we miss years. So whatever we have, that's that's used in the analysis. Each one of those recorded performance data points is a isn't a separate independent point. Um, across the board, though, we want the average maximum distress values to exceed 50% of the design criteria. So specifically, what I mean by this is, let's say our agency threshold for rutting is three quarters of an inch. That's you know basically our our action point where we have to do something. Okay, that means that the pavement sections that we're using in our design matrix, uh, the average maximum rutting of those sections should be greater than half that threshold. So they ha should be at least three eighths of an inch. Uh, if you're only using pavement sections at low levels of distress, the they could bias the calibration results. So kind of what I was talking about in the previous slide, the fact is, is you may only have up to 10 years worth of data. You can still go through the calibration, but again, um, there could be some bias there that you're not aware of until you get more longer term data over time, and then you can re-verify the models and, and recalibrate if necessary. So talk a little bit about the performance of materials data collection. Um, this is uh, an issue that, uh, agencies have struggled with and it's a very simple idea here but it, it it's uh, uh agencies still run into um, to problems when they're trying to use their asset management data and that that's the fact that the the measured distresses in the field have to match the pavement me design analysis output and why would that be a problem well a lot of agencies have their own homegrown scoring system for uh <clears throat> for asset management where a lot of times you're combining distress quantity and severity together level in one score. As an example, let's say we're scoring uh, a certain distress on a, uh, or say cracking, we're, we're scoring it on a rating of one to 10. Okay, we have a pavement section which has a high number of low severity cracks. We're rating that as a five. And then we have another pavement section that has a low amount of high severity cracks. Well, that's also a five. Well, you know, obviously you can see you, 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 they're not the same. And so you just can't take the score and it, it, it's, it's meaningless. So essentially this data has to be reinterpreted. Uh, it's important to note the pavement ME design program only predicts distress quantities, not severity level. So uh, the pavement management system data has to be. Another issue too is the fact that uh, uh, even if you are quantifying it, it may not be. It may still not be in the same units. You know, you could be measuring something in feet. The pavement ME design program predicts it in area or square feet. And uh, I just want to mention here the best source of guidance for how to measure distresses in the field. Uh, after many years, is still the uh, Federal Highway document, uh, the Distress Identification Manual. This was used as the basis of all the field data collection for the long-term payment performance program sections, test sections. And uh, at this point in time, it, it, uh, there were a few things that had to be changed uh, uh, unit-wise in the payment ME design predictions, but we're at the point where uh, pretty much the uh, all the the distress measurement units, the type of units for distress predictions in the pavement ME design program match what is in the distress identification manual. So they line up pretty well. So that's the best source. Now, uh, when you collect your performance data, it's always good to look it over uh, section by section and see if the results make sense. It's very tempting to want to throw out outliers simply because you know they're going to mess with your bias and, and precision when you're doing the analysis. However, you have to avoid that temptation. You can throw out a data point if you have an explanation for why it should be thrown out. 
Uh, one example would be, let's say one year, uh, we knew that the data collection equipment was malfunctioning. Okay, so we got some weird measurements. That could be a good justification. If you can't come up with an explanation, though, in order to maintain the integrity of this whole process, you really have to live with it and, and leave it in there. Okay, so and on the materials side, a lot of these transfer functions and the damage models have material property inputs, whether it's uh, some form of strength, uh, stiffness, creep compliance, uh, shear modulus, just different inputs that require testing. There are three levels of input in the pavement ME design. The first level, which is the best, is level one. This is where you're directly measuring the material property that is used in these uh, in these uh, numerical models. And uh, you know, if you can, yeah, level one is great, but it usually requires the most expense and effort as well. Level two is estimating level one, the or the you know the direct input through a correlation. A uh, good example here would be uh, flexural, flexural strength would be the level one input for concrete, but your state that doesn't do third point uh, beam testing. So you do a lot of compressive strength testing. You can correlate pretty well compressive strength to flexural strength. So that'd be your level two input. Level three is I'm not doing any testing. I'm just going to go with uh, whatever the default or the national averages are. And there are default values in the pavement image design program. So you always have default values to use. Uh, if you have no idea what they really are. Now, in theory, the idea is, is that the mean prediction between these levels should be the same. It probably isn't always going to work out that way, but that's the idea. Where they differ is in the standard error. So in order, uh, at level one should have the least amount of standard error, level two, you know, intermediate. And then level three would logically have the highest uh, level um, or the highest standard error. So that's that's really what you're trying to improve by going to a higher level of input. You can mix and match your input levels. Um, there's a lot of documentation on the sensitivity analysis of inputs in the pavement ME design to distress prediction. I would recommend you uh, referencing those if you want to learn more about it. But the idea is is that if you're going to do level one or higher level uh, effort in coming up with your inputs, apply that effort to the inputs that have the most impact on, on the distress prediction sensitivity. That makes sense. So in other words, why do level one if, if uh, within the range of normal values for that input, um, it makes very little difference as far as the output goes. Another important point here, though, is that whatever you, in other words, however you mix and match level inputs, they have to be the same for the verification and calibration as what you normally do with the design. So if you if you do your calibration using different level inputs, your standard error is not going to be the same as what you it's what as what it would have been if you were running just regular designs with your normal uh, input level procedures. So uh, again, you know the reason why we're why we're doing all this material testing is these inputs are required in the uh, in the numerical uh, transfer function and, and damage equation models. Um, I'll also mention here too the fact that level one inputs, you know, it, it is an, an actual measurement of the material property. However, we call them quasi because don't well, think about it. You're you're running the design for a project. Um, you may be running it a year in advance. You know the mix type. You might be able to specify the performance binder, the gradation, but you don't know the exact asphalt content uh, that the contractor is going to come up with their mix design. You don't necessarily know the uh, the source of the aggregate. So there are things that you can't accurately, totally accurately model beforehand, and so that's why it's quasi in nature. So it should be pretty close. You're, you're using kind of surrogate values for mixes that should approximate what's actually being used in the field. Uh, and two, you can't just run mixed testing on everything uh, for these values. A lot of times you're going to have to go out in order to get kind of the uh, uh, 
an accurate snapshot of what the current material properties are of one of your pavement sections that's you know that you're putting in the design matrix is to go out and actually uh, core it and uh, process that uh, the material uh, using whatever test that you can you can run on those. So what happens when we vary? Okay, so at this point in time, we've put together our design matrix. Uh, we have all the pavement sections we need. We've collected the performance data uh, from those sections, either, you know, again, going out in the field, collecting it or doing uh, uh, pavement in, or uh, doing the, uh, from the asset management. Uh, so now we're going to do, we're going to assess the bias in the standard error. We're using what we call a probability value, which is normally 0.05. And I want, don't want to bore you with statistics, but basically what this means is, is we're looking at our null hypothesis is the mean difference we measure and predict is zero. There's two others. Uh, the null hypothesis is that the intercept equals zero and that the slope equals one. And we're also not just running these tests. So if it fails the null hypothesis, if it's under 0.05, that's reason to reject the notion that the predicted measures equal the measure or predicted equals the measured uh, uh, <clears throat> values. And we can also graphically look at it. We can we can look at these areas where we have high under prediction or low under prediction and maybe go back through the design to the design matrix, take those out, rerun the analysis. There may be reasons such as, you know, why is it under predicting uh, or over predicting distress? Maybe because some maintenance did a surface level nobody knew about. Uh, poor construction defects for under predicting distress, such as, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, contractor didn't tack layers properly. So you can take those out and then rerun those. Another way of looking at this is looking at a residual error graph, kind of the same thing as the previous graph, just showing it in a different format. Uh, and finally, okay, so we've, we've either failed the null hypothesis test or we are not happy with the bias and standard error. So we make the decision, we're gonna go ahead and calibrate and validate. So you have to split your available independent data set. You have to split it, and we're gonna split it into an 80, 20% range. This is the normal range. In other words, 80% for calibration, 20% for validation. So when we validate, after we validate the calibration, in other words, we're using this independent data set and it checks out. It's, it's matching what's being predicted with the new local calibration factors. So then we recombine the entire data set and then we rerun it in order to get the standard deviation. Standard deviation is important because that impacts the reliability level in the payment and design program. Uh, the, uh, you know, so the lower the standard deviation, uh, that means that basically you, you can avoid over designing pavements. And I don't want to bore people with, with, uh, showing, uh, um, equations here, but just to show you real quickly what's happening. Uh, you normally start with the transfer function itself, adjust those coefficients. And you can see here by increasing, we have a C4 and C5 coefficient. This is the cracking combination of bottom up of top down fatigue cracking concrete. And uh, by increasing it, it has various effects on the cracking prediction. If you can't tweak the model enough doing this, to lower your standard uh, error and bias enough, then you go to the damage model and you adjust those coefficients. And again, you could see the impact of, in this case, increasing either of those coefficients. Uh, this is kind of the same thing showing the bottom of the T cracking calibration model for, uh, for asphalt. Again, start with the transfer function, play around with the C1, C2 coefficients. Those should be shown up twice, sorry about that. Uh, and then if that doesn't work, go to the damage model You've got these beta coefficients here, and you know, to visually kind of show this a little better what's happening, let's say at 20% alligator cracking. So we said if, if we in increase the C1 coefficient, it's going to decrease the, uh, the cracking prediction at different damage levels. So at 20% cracking, uh, we have a, a relatively low, maybe a better way of looking at this is go vertically. So let's say at a, a given damage level, uh, for the, the higher coefficient of two, you can see we have almost no alligator cracking predicted. But then if we go up here 
to the lower, as we lower the coefficient, then the alligator cracking prediction increases at the same damage, incremental damage level. There's an order of calibration. You do the new design, new design models first, because those are required. You need those calibration coefficients in order to go to the asphalt overlay design, um, because it's derivative of those previous distresses. And then finally, the next step is smoothness. So smoothness is going to be derivative of these previous distress models. And so you need those to be worked out before you can go ahead and, and change the uh, calibration coefficients. And uh, this is just showing uh, this, you know, this is what we're, what we're trying to do here. You can see this the globally calibrated rutting model, a lot of bias, a lot of standard error. Um, and so obviously P value is very, very low. We're rejecting the null hypothesis. And after we go through local calibration, voila, everything looks great. Bias is about cut in half. And, you know, our squared is not super great. Standard error is still a little high, but uh, technically it's accepted using the null hypothesis. And it passes the eye test. This looks a whole lot better than this. Uh, last slide here, uh, calibration assistance tool. There is a product that takes a lot of the computational work out of your hands, does it automatically. Um, <clears throat> what it does is it takes the data, populates your design matrix when you set it up. It does all the statistical analysis, can identify outliers in the, uh, the performance data, does the comparison between predicted and measured distress, uh, calculates bias, standard error, does the hypothesis testing. And finally, it goes through, uh, it, it'll incrementally change the calibration coefficients to eliminate bias and, and standard error until it comes up with the optimal combination. And sorry, I had to kind of rush through that at the end. I know I was short on time. That is the end of the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. You certainly made a dry topic uh, very interesting. Wish we had more time. Uh, we do have a number of questions, which we'll get to momentarily, and we may not have enough time to address all of them. Uh, like the first, um, tell you about our up and coming webinars for 2024. Uh, you can register uh, at the site that you see here. Many of you are repeat customers and we uh, certainly appreciate that very much. On January 31st, uh, Dr. Young Lee will be presenting traffic speed deflectometer, the preliminary lessons learned from our uh, departed colleague, Susan, Dr. Doug Seal. And this is a new computer program for flexible pavement response under moving loads. On Valentine's Day, February the 14th, we'll be celebrating the fifth year anniversary of the ARA Webinar Wednesdays. And I've been asked by our upper management to uh, share what I learned in 51 years of practice. I promised during that webinar not to use the word pavement because uh, that's not my background. Okay, so if we don't get to all the uh, questions, and we do have a couple, as I mentioned, um, you see John's email address here, and he's uh, similar to all our presenters, graciously uh, agreed to take questions for the next 48 hours. Please make them germane to his particular topic and don't ask a question in the form of consultancy. That really would not be appropriate. So the first question, John, is then we've got a couple. We only have a few minutes, so we may not get all all of these. First question is: Is there any plan for including bootstrapping in the CAT tool? Yes, there is. That's on our to-do list. Um, <clears throat> but uh, bootstrapping and uh, inject, I think, if possible, we'll have both those methods in there. Okay. And then the next question, and it's a bit long, so bear with me from Dr. Khan is, do you need laboratory material test data to change the beta factors in the damage models, or do you change them without lab testing data to match the prediction and the observed distresses like you would do for the transfer function coefficient? Okay. Um, yeah, I'll try to, okay, I, I did mention there the fact that the, the order of adjusting calibration as coefficient starts with the transfer function first. In other words, uh, you know, taking the material response property or the damage accumulation, basically taking the damage accumulation, relating it directly to some observed distress. Start with that. And then uh, if that doesn't work well enough, then you, you, you back up a step 
and you start working with the material law itself, which usually incorporates directly uh, those material properties. Now, there was, um, and uh, I'm not even well versed to go to go dive too deeply into this, but there were with the global calibration, there was some combining of the different coefficients. There are coefficients that are meant for really the uh, uh, that are, are more for the lab testing, the direct material measure uh, material property measurements, and then there are the coefficients that are meant for as, as kind of like the peak yield shift uh, coefficients uh, to match observed stresses. Some of them were combined together initially. Uh, later on, with later versions of the pavement and design program, they were broken out so that the, the, the new global calibration coefficients separate material testing from from the field shift functions. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. And I, I know Pablo has asked a number of questions, and Pablo, unfortunately, we're out of time now in the Q and A program. We ran over a little bit on the presentation. However, John will get back to you related to your questions. Uh, those of you who uh, kind of were focused on John, as well as looking at the PowerPoints, uh, maybe can't uh, formulate a question concurrently, feel free, next 48 hours, send us your questions. So just a few slides left, actually two. All, everybody who is joined for the entire hour of the webinar will receive one hour of PDH credit and a copy of the presentation in uh, PDF form, uh, probably two slides per page is our normal format. Please allow about three weeks to receive it. And uh, we do record all these webinars, and that recording should be available at, by going to the ARA Webinar Wednesday site. Uh, so ARA is always looking for great people to join our team. We strive to hire valuable colleagues, not only for the right skills, but to demonstrate our core values of passion, freedom, service, and growth. Um, our motto offline is, online is, science and engineering for fun and profit. So if you're interested in the current employment opportunities within our uh, ARA transportation and infrastructure offices, please send a brief resume and your contact information to the site that you see here. Have a blessed day. Oh, and one remaining thing, a number of you will be at the Transportation Research Board annual meeting coming up uh, beginning on January the 7th through that week, always one of the most miserable weather weeks in Washington. And please visit us at, in the exhibit hall at booth 731. And uh, if you come by that booth, you will receive an invitation to our hospitality suite receptions both Sunday and Tuesday evening. Blessed holiday season, and thank you all for joining us today.